Manas, como están? Selam kedusan endemen alachu. Hi church, how are you doing? It is good to not see you all, but uh, be seen by you all today. Before we get into today's message, I just wanted to give us all a reminder of the power of God's word. It's amazing that God's word is so good that it can reach us wherever we are. We don't have to be in this place. We don't have to be all gathered together for God's word to impact us and have influence in our lives and to move us somewhere that God has for us. There is nowhere that we can go that's outside of God's knowledge and his care. And his purpose has a work today that God wants to, to use his word to do. So I just want to encourage you, would you dive in with me as we get ready to hear from the Lord what he has for us? We started a new series last week called Shipwrecked, and this is a series on suffering and what we can do when the storms of life threaten us. Pastor Arnold taught us from James 1 that we can ask God for wisdom to get through storms and really be strengthened by them. And today I want to spend some time meditating on another aspect of storms, and it's this, that we never sail through them alone. Let's talk about the value of our suffering. It's kind of a funny thing to say. There's, you might respond to that with a the question, there's, what do you mean there's value in suffering? I would say that there is, and we're going to talk about that. Because did you know that your suffering is always followed by your response to it? You will always respond to suffering, whether it's in one way or another. Why is this obvious statement important? Well, like we just said, we never sail alone. So when our ship gets wrecked, when our life goes awry, our perspective and our response to tragedy is perhaps God's greatest opportunity at glory through our lives. It's like investing in the stock market. When the stock prices couldn't get any lower, uh, you invest, right? I, uh, you know, I just invested my first $100 in the stock market, um, and lo and behold, I am now $6 poorer than when I uh, first invested. But, you know, I believe I'm going to have a testimony that a year from now, I am going to have $6 in profit, so I will have $106 um, that I do not, do not have right now. But you know, our response to suffering is like that. When, when the stock prices couldn't get any lower, that's when you're supposed to invest for a coming reward. And when we respond to suffering, it's like we're investing, we're sacrificing now in a time of drought for a coming reward. In my life, there's one storm, one event that has singularly affected me in ways that no other event will or could. And today I'm going to share with you a response to that storm that continues to affect me to this day. As many of you know, my mother passed away when I was 10 years old, and my dad, Steve, who attended People's Church for over 20 years, um, he was left with four kids and just the shambles of his own life to pick up and handle all on his own. And to be totally honest with you, uh, this happened when I was 10 years old. I'm 25 now and married and, and super thankful for everything that God has done in my life. But to be totally honest with you, over the last 15 years of my life, I, I would describe it as I've been haunted by the possibility of, of what happened to my dad happening to me in my life. I've imagined what my dad must have gone through over and over and over again like a bad dream that just keeps coming back. I think about what it'd be like for me to experience that same type of tragedy in my own life. I have questions like, what would I do if that happened to me? Could I actually handle that? Would I actually be able to recover emotionally and, and mentally and spiritually, relationally from that happening to me? I have honestly and sincerely asked these questions, been surrounded by these questions, and I have not always answered them with faith. A lot of times, I've answered them with doubtful fear. 
If you ask me up to this point in my life what my greatest fear is, it would have to be of that happening to me. And I believe that we all have a that. It's not unique to me because suffering is something that, you know, covers us all. We all experience this at some point and probably multiple points in our lives. But I believe we all have a that. A that is something that we can point our finger at and say, yes, that is it. That is my greatest fear. That is my greatest dread. That is my greatest anxiety in life. It is that thing right there. Maybe for you, that is failing as a parent. Maybe that is not living up to someone else's expectations or their standard for you. Maybe that is something else altogether. But I want to encourage you today that that doesn't have to grip you with fear. If you're like me, you fear a lot. You've been, fear has just kind of been a part of your, your way of operating and, and living, but God has just been so reminding me recently that I don't, I don't have to fear that. And I want to encourage you to do the same today because when that happens, when storms like that happen, faith teaches us how to swim even when our ship gets wrecked. So I share this part of my life with you because the fact of the matter is, praise be to God that my dad didn't drown when that happened to him. He, he, he didn't. He, you know, did he thrive? I'm not sure. Did he have doubts and, and frustrations and stress and fear? And did he not know what to do most of the time? I, I am confident that, that all of those things are true. But I love the man that, that did not drown, that did not give up when he could have. And I respect him And I love him so much for this testimony in his life of being brave and having courage to get through this storm in his life. He didn't drown. Maybe you know someone in your life who didn't drown when they could have. And looking at them and looking at how they responded to their suffering just fills you with courage to do the same. I hope that's what you get out of today and you're filled with courage to act likewise. My dad experienced what suffering infused with faith looks like. And we read about this in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 through 12. And it says this, Paul is saying this. Now, last week, Pastor Arnold shared with us the passage that's kind of framing this series where Paul, in 2 Corinthians 11, where Paul is framing, you know, how much suffering he has endured for the gospel and for the people that God wants so desperately to reach. He shares about how he's been beaten, he's been stoned, he's been shipwrecked, he's been lashed, he has been surrounded by danger, all for the sake of the gospel. But he made it through. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 12 says this, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. You see, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Sometimes God allows death to be at work in us in order to give life to those we sail with. Did you know that through Jesus' death, we get new life? Because of his experience of death, we have the opportunity to have eternal and lasting new life. And your response to suffering in some amazing grace-filled way does the same. Perhaps the greatest testimony of my dad's life that is a powerful example and encouragement to me as his son is that he didn't drown when his ship got wrecked. He didn't give up when he had every opportunity to. 
And the question for all of us today is, will someone think of you? Honestly, ask yourself, if you're going through a storm or a, a, just a way of suffering right now of any kind, will someone think of you and how you have responded to this tragedy, and will they be filled with courage to do the same? Will your memory be a blessing Will the memory of your suffering be a blessing to those around you? Because the fact of the matter is that we never sail alone. I want to pick back up in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Paul says this, So we don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction. That's amazing that he calls his, the things that he has endured, light and momentary. These light and momentary afflictions, they're preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. This passage highlights what I like to call the transition to transcendence. It's a nice little title, right? The transition to transcendence. What do I mean by transcendence? Well, Colossians 3 helps us understand this a little bit better, and I want to read that for you in the first three verses. And it says this, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, not on things that are happening here on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Transcending is this setting of our hearts and of our minds on those truest things which are unseen which we can't see with our physical eyes, setting our hearts and our minds on those good things that are true and real. In a collection of his sermons called Strength to Love, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, has this quote I want to share with you. And I encourage you, uh, if you've never read anything by Dr. King, I encourage you, this uh, work just encouraged me and fed me so much. It's a great introduction to his, his thought in philosophy and theology and in his work, Strength to Love. Um, but he says this, God is neither hard-hearted nor soft-minded. He is tough-minded enough to transcend the world. He is tender-hearted enough to live in it. He does not leave us alone in our agonies and struggles. He seeks us in dark places and suffers with us and for us in our tragic prodigality. We see this in Jesus' incarnation. The, the taking on of our humanity, the incarnation, was costly to him. It cost him everything. He suffered. He was shamed. He was humiliated. And he ultimately died from his suffering. I want to share another quote that Dr. King uh, has in, in Strength to Love, and I'll use inclusive language so it'll sound a little different than he writes it, but it says this, the ultimate measure of people is not where they stand in moments of comfort and convenience, but where they stand in times of challenge and controversy. The true neighbor will risk their position, their privilege, and even their life for the welfare of others. In dangerous valleys and hazardous pathways, they will lift some bruised and beaten brother or sister to a higher and more noble life. And we see this in Jesus, don't we? Like, he suffered. He suffered. And his response to that suffering is what was remembered by those he sailed with, by those around him. If you read the Gospels, these real stories of Jesus' life in Matthew and Mark and Luke and in John in the New Testament, these, these, the authors of these books, they don't spend great detail giving you know, information about the type of suffering that Jesus experienced in the crucifixion. A lot of times that's where our minds go. When we, if you've ever seen Passion of the Christ, you see just this excruciating detail of the physical torture and torment 
that Jesus probably experienced on his way to the cross and, and during his crucifixion, of the crown of thorns just being pressed on his head and the blood dripping down, of the nails being pierced in his hands and his feet, of him being scourged and beaten and humiliated and spit on. And we see all of these things, all of these aspects, and they're important and they're implied, but they're not the emphasis. They're not the focus of these gospel writings. These writers instead focus on what Jesus says and what he does while he is suffering. These memories of Jesus, the disciples' memories of Jesus that we get in the gospels, of his life, of his death, of his resurrection, and of his ascension, these things are what birthed the early church. These same disciples obeyed Jesus and they looked to be filled with the Holy Spirit just like he was. They saw their teacher, their friend, and their God experience suffering in such a way that they were filled with courage to do the same. Have, do you have anyone in your life who you've seen how they have gone through something and you've looked at that and you've been fearful of that thing happening to you but you see someone else go through it and you see them come through on the other side and you see them go through this storm and this suffering. Not perfect, not totally graceful, but they come through it and they find themselves on the other side still following the Lord. That is what these disciples got to experience as they saw Jesus suffer. They saw what he did. They saw they heard what he said, and they were filled with courage to do the same. And we are all here because of that courage. If you have time this week, you do have time this week, uh, hashtag quarantine, I want you to read Isaiah 53. I encourage you, read Isaiah 53. Here we read of what's called a, a man of sorrows. And we know this to be a prophecy about Jesus. But it says that Jesus is a man who's familiar with suffering. And we're able to follow this man of sorrows through our own suffering because he's been down that road before. He's walked it. He's lived it. Given his all in going on that road. He's our great high priest who was tender-hearted enough to live in our suffering-filled existence, but tough-minded enough to transcend it and restore it. Don't ever underestimate your suffering. Don't ever underestimate your suffering, because your response to it could mean someone else's response to Jesus. Let me, let me say it again. I'll step out from behind the podium so that you can really hear, hear that again in case you were drifting off. Your response to suffering could mean someone else's response to Jesus by seeing how you handle yourself and seeing who you rely on. Don't underestimate it. If you're in your house or your apartment or your condo, or you're in someone else's house or apartment or condo right now, I want you to look at your dining room table or your kitchen table right now if you have one and think with me for a second about what that table represents besides just a place to toss the mail when you bring it inside. I am not guilty of that. Um, my mail does not just find its way on the table. It finds its, its little way all over the house and in the nooks and crannies and sometimes in the closet. I don't know how that happens, but, you know, it, it just it goes everywhere. That's not the point of, our, of what we're talking about. But nonetheless, the mail finds itself in places it should not be. But take a look at your table. Think about what it represents. Tables are places where we gather where we celebrate. We celebrate holidays. We celebrate birthdays. We celebrate achievements. We, we celebrate just getting through the day sometimes, right? And there are also places where we can sit down and we can talk to our loved ones about what's really going on in our lives. And Psalm 23 talks about a table that God sets for us. And in closing, I want to read this for you and then just pull a few things out of that to encourage us today. 
So let me read Psalm 23 for you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As we work through our suffering and shipwrecked lives, God has a few reminders for us that we just read in Psalm 23. Let me rephrase a few of them for you. God reminds us that he's our shepherd and that he's good. He leads us in his paths of righteousness. He reminds us that we're never alone. Our shepherd is always with us. He reminds us that when we suffer, he suffers with us. Him never leaving us means that no matter what, no matter what we experience or go through, he experiences that too. He reminds us that, we're surround, that when we're surrounded by tragedy, whether externally in our circumstances or internally in fear and anxiety and torment, God has a table set for us. In Bible language, what is a table? You might think the Bible was written a long time ago. Uh, their tables might look a little different than ours today. Well, that is true. Um, a table in the Bible can signify celebrating a festival, uh, having a feast, sharing a meal, it can signify a relationship between the one who is hosting and the one who is invited to a meal. Maybe in your culture, you don't sit at tables to celebrate or share a meal. Maybe you sit on the ground or you sit on pillows. and Maybe you eat with your hands and not with forks and knives. This psalm doesn't even talk about a physical wooden table. It's actually referring to an animal skin that's been laid on the ground and the food and everything has been placed on there. It's kind of like a makeshift table out, outside, out in the wilderness, if you will. Because David wrote this psalm, and when he writes that he is, when he is surrounded by his enemies, God prepares a table for him, he's being literal. He's being serious. He is literally, physically surrounded by enemies. He has experienced this himself, and he has experienced that even when the storms surround him, God has prepared a table for him and invited him in. This psalm is telling us that there is a table waiting for us that we have not set. That there is food waiting for us that we have not prepared. And that there is a host waiting anxiously to welcome us in, in the midst of our suffering. As we close today, let's remember the table God has prepared for us in our storms. Like the rainbow is a sign of God's faithfulness, tables can be a reminder of God's presence with us in our suffering and our storms. Our responses don't have to be dictated by our circumstances. We will always respond, and God is inviting us to respond in the right way so that others can respond to him. Let's pray. God of love, you suffer with us. You've made a way for us through your son, Jesus, that doesn't always make sense. But we love and we trust you because you loved us first. And God, we just say right now, we will fear no evil because you are with us. We trust that. We trust your good. We trust you in the storm. You're inviting us in. God, give us the perspective to sit at the table and be with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.